Putting the time in the presence of a quorum, I will call tonight's uh, meeting of the Acton Board of Selectmen to order. So as always, we will start with citizens' concerns. Are there any citizens who wish to speak to items not otherwise on the agenda? Yes. It's Tara Fredericks, West Acton. I have um, a comment and then a concern. I just want to thank Steve and his whole crew. The DocuShare uh, folder convention, naming conventions are really helpful. They're much more consistent. It's much easier to find things. Um, and the practice of putting the committee, the link to the folder to get the background information actually on the agenda, that's something that, that they've done for a long time on the Board of Selectmen agendas. But CBA, other, other um, committees, I think it's been really helpful for people. And also, to the folks at home, um, there's a button on DocuShare that says you, the last four days you can see everything that's been uploaded. I'd love for that to be changed to 30 days, but nonetheless, people can go there and do that. And my concern is about the um, survey that has been put out. Um, apparently, the town has hired a consultant to convince us that we need more high-density housing um, to be able to get the kinds of businesses that we want. Um, and I found the survey to be very biased um, towards leading you to want to have more development, growth, high-density housing, additional um, building. So we created our own uh, biased survey. And so people can find that by writing at, to info at slowvillage.org. Um, and it asks questions like, do you want affordable housing? Uh, what would you like to subsidize at the various income levels? And I think that you guys would maybe like to look at this. We have 93 responses so far. Um, it's whether or not we want to continue pushing uh, growth to the villages or not, whether we want to um, convert existing units. That was uh, almost 80% said yes. And we had a wide range of uh, respondents. Um, we, well, I don't know exactly who did because it's anonymous, but we have all the IP addresses if you want to do that research. Um, but we advertised on the Acton Forum, the Green Acton List, and on mine, which is basically officials or ex-officials. So, uh, and everybody's welcome to take it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else with items not otherwise on the agenda? Okay, great. All right, my chairman's update. Um, as a reminder, the Historical Commission will be holding a public forum on their chap the chapter and uh, demo delay bylaw and proposed changes to that this Thursday, June 21st at 7 p.m. in this room. Um, I'm not sure if it will be televised or not, but I encourage people to attend to learn more um, eventually if, if uh, the plan is to bring those proposed changes to um, town meeting either in the fall or next spring. So uh, please attend and, and uh, have your voice heard on that. There's also this Thursday the Classical mus Music in the Park concert starting at 6.30 at NARA and all are welcome to attend that. Hopefully we'll have uh, much better weather than we're having tonight. Um, and there will be a public outreach meeting on um, the Main Street and Prospect Street intersection to solicit um, public input on improvements to that intersection and that will be on Wednesday June 27th at 7 p.m. also in this room. Um, and while we will have a lot more time to celebrate him also on this Thursday, a busy night, I did want to note that it is uh, our town manager, Steve Ledoux's last meeting as a town manager, or last board of selectmen meeting at least, as a town manager, and just to thank him uh, for all of his years of service. Um, he's been the only town manager while I've been on the board and I think has done a wonderful job and I've really enjoyed my many years working with him. And I know we all uh, deeply appreciate all of our time with him. And like I said, we'll have more time to uh, celebrate him at his retirement party on the 21st. But I just wanted to note that and say thank you, Steve. And if you have any words you want to add tonight to your uh, <laughs> town manager uh, update. Well, thank you. And I, and I, I want to thank the board because it's, uh, it, you know, the boards over my 10 years have made, made my job really easy. I found all the boards very, very thoughtful. and. and and really, really think about the issues and think about how they affect the citizens. So uh, you guys have, have made my job easy. And I've actually been very lucky. Over 41 years, I've historically had good boards and worked in good towns. So I've been, I've been extraordinarily lucky. And I, and I do appreciate all the support over the years. And uh, you know, it's like I said a year ago when I announced my retirement, it's, it's bittersweet. You know, I'm going to be sad about it. but. I've got some, uh, you know, new chapters in my life I'll be dealing with, and I'll be hammering nails at the Habitat House on uh, on uh, School Street, uh, Fourth of July week. So, <laughs> be one of the first things I'll be doing. 
Um, but once again, I want to thank everybody uh, for their support over the years. Uh, and just a couple, uh, couple updates. Um, we are, uh, and police are monitoring, but we're having a lot of issues with the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, particularly bikers not stopping when they're, when they're crossing, particularly Concord Road, Brook Street, um, even, even uh, Main Street over by, over by Nara. They're not, not pushing buttons, they're not using the lights, and uh, so the police have uh, stepped up some monitoring of the situation. Um, also, we have learned that the, that the, uh, um, the state, the, the horse barn, the old historic house that's over by the state police horse barn has received an historic preservation grant, and I guess they'll be doing finally some cleanup of that, of that building that's not been in the best shape uh, uh, since then, uh, since for at least as long as I've been here. Um, uh, we awarded a, a contract for the, uh, for the uh, uh, rail trail parking at, at the Ice House Pond. Uh, if you've been down Concord Road, some of the, some of the clearing is occurring for that. Uh, we're also winding up uh, the end of the fiscal year and, 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 and trying to uh, get a sense of where we might uh, end up uh, free cash wise. And uh, if you remember, when we, uh, when we talked about the, uh, the gas hookup for uh, the Habitat property on, on School Street, I think it was last meeting, uh, it was mentioned that there was a significant gas leak in that area. We've, we've uh, uh, National Grid is, we'll be replacing the gas line from uh, on School Street from Maine to Chadwick, so that, that is happening, so um, that, that's good news. And finally, you may have noticed outside here, and, and also the train station, we are installing uh, charging stations for, the, uh, for, for electric cars. And that's my report. All right, well, good final report. A lot of good news, so <laughs> thank you. And again, you'll, we are gonna miss you a lot, uh, but excited for new chapters for you, and uh, we'll see where the town goes from here, so. Save the bad news for Mr. Mangerati the next meeting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> His first report can be a real downer. Um, <laughs> Okay, we're not quite at 7.10, so I'm going to hold off on reading that um, briefly, and we will do the consent agenda, so I'll read through those, and please say hold if you have anything you'd like to hold. Um, number seven, the letter of support for a grant from the Division of Fish and Wildlife's River Ecological Restoration Fund for 53 River Street. Number eight, the request to dispose of obsolete... Yes, Jim, do you have a question? Um, when you get to the part about... Um, new road construction I'd, uh, connections. I'd like to hold. So I'd like to have someone hold that if possible. Yeah, so you have to ask a member to hold it. Generally, yes. it's better to ask us beforehand and otherwise to do it maybe during citizens' concerns. Um, I will hold it tonight, though. Thank uh, you. But in the future, help with the email. Um, okay, number eight, request to dispose of obsolete items, Act and Memorial Library. Number nine, farmer winery license for Pony Shack Cider for the Act and Boxborough Farmers Market. Number 10, a one-day alcoholic beverage license for Corey Loader, Nara Park, July 1st, 2018. Number 11, one-day alcoholic beverage license, Francis Bean, Nara Park, July 15th, 2018. Number 12, one-day alcoholic beverage license, House Rabbit Network, Nara Park, July 29th, 2018. Number 13, committee appointments, Vivian Birchall and Jin Hong Yang, full members of the Acton Boxborough Cultural Council. Number 14, committee appointment, Chung Sheng Fu, full member of the Council on Aging. Number 15, committee appointment, Nirupanu Velankar, associate member of the Council on Aging. Number 16, committee appointment, R. Luke Evans, full member of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Number 17, committee appointment, Yi Emily Ying, associate member of the Board of Appeals. Number 18, the road of way construction request, which I'll hold. And number 19, accept gift recreation department, a gift totaling $250 in donations for funding a new recreation facility and playground at Jones Field. Um, do you want to briefly address number 18, Jim? Oh. I come back to you guys every time there's a new gas connection. So this isn't anything new. Um, I guess there's some little bit of new information this time. Um, the connections to uh, Liberty Street and to Anthem Village um, down there in the Maple Martin area um, hold some of Acton's uh, remaining largest gas leaks. Um, so I'm happy to report that Corey was 
quickly responsive when I asked him about this and was able to report that um, gas company is considering uh, working on one leak there and working on replacing uh, an entire main there. Um, it's important. It's an old coated steel uh, main from uh, the 60s, I think, unless it's one of the ones from the 30s. It's real old. It's very leaky. Um, the only other thing, the only other one here that I wanted to call out, and just so that you're aware of the context of all this, is the one at Two Huron Road in Indian Village. Indian Village is a place where, over the next decades, uh, we're playing a slow but important chess game there. Uh, some of Indian Village has gas connections. Some of Indian Village has fuel oil. Um, now that the technology is there for people to go right from fuel oil to modern air source heat pumps, um, this is the direction we want to find some way of bringing them to, rather than paying the extra fees for um, bringing gas lines to their houses. Um, I think I've said all this before. This is a vote, which means you can vote for it or against it. There's consequences either way. Um, Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jim. Okay, are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Yeah, I just had one question. At one point, we were considering a, a bylaw that would require the gas company to fix leaks uh, within a certain radius of uh, new lines they were installing. Has there been any progress on that, or do we know where that is? Right. So we were considering a bylaw that was similar to Boston's bylaw, um, which they passed and has been challenged in court. Um, so it's a little bit on hold while we watch that and also while we work on finalizing the sustainability policy. So the thought was to not move forward with that bylaw um, until we have the sustainability policy in place and then to consider either that bylaw or um, other bylaw options. Um, so we are still talking about it, but it's not ready yet. So that was that. Yes, briefly, because we're um, now. Just FYI, uh, the CLF lawyers, um, I've been corresponding with them, and they're going to get me the materials uh, to look at the Boston case, and they agree that there are ways to reconstruct something else that comes at it in a different direction. Also, I think you, you had said at one point that you thought that Corey or whoever talks to the gas company would uh, have a lot of luck or more luck if they said something. And I think Janet said something like, if, the, if he can let them know that we're planning to get this done and take stronger action or they can take it themselves or something. I can't remember exactly what Janet said, but Corey's here, and so I'd like to re-understand um, re what that was that, that, that we were saying that we might be able sure, to do. Sure, I don't want to get into a huge Thank back you. and forth, so briefly, I, Janet. I didn't, you know, I didn't um, say threaten them. I just said that maybe, you know, we, we could take firmer action if they weren't cooperative in making repairs. Um, in the areas where we're doing extensions. Um, but I didn't, certainly wasn't alluding at all to the sort of Boston sort of ordinance mimicking that had been discussed earlier, so. Yeah, and I think some of the comments I made were around that, which is that they have already taken notice uh, due to a lot of the steps we've already taken, which is why we're seeing a lot of these being fixed, as well as the relationship Corey's built with them. So, uh, frankly, at this point, having a more cordial relationship is getting more things where they know we also have the education information out there, I think is getting a lot more done. Um, okay, but with that, and if there are no other comments from board members, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Okay. Second. Okay, Joan moves, Janet seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, all right, so then we'll go back to the 710 p.m. traffic rules and orders for Strawberry Hill Road parking. Um, prohibition, and we have a memo from the chief of police in our packet, but I believe Corey is here to talk about that tonight. And Corey, since you're here for a million things, if you want to just sit up there, uh, that would be perfect. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here tonight on behalf of the police and fire. Um, they requested to have a park and prohibition on Strawberry Hill Road. It's a section that they were looking at runs from Great Road down to Estabrook. Um, they've, I guess they've been dealing with some on-street parking. 
the, the police had some concerns um, as you're looking down the street with on street parking and sort of the, the sight lines along the road were with the sections that are narrow or have some bends in them. Um, the fire department's concerns mostly revolved around if there's uh, parking on one side of the road, uh, getting in, in and out of uh, apartments. Uh, they had concerns they might not be able to get their larger apparatus in and out. Uh, so the, the request that we had before the board tonight would be a prohibition on both sides from Great Road to Estabrook. Uh, we, we do have um, a resident at 39 who is opposed to um, a prohibition near, near their home uh, for concerns about when they have guests or parties, that they wouldn't be allowed to have people parked on the street. And they had some other concerns relative to um, speeding and just general traffic on the road itself. So um, I think that was the the only concern that I had. I believe um, a representative from Rapscallion might be here tonight as well to speak on their behalf. So. Great, thank you, Corey. Are yep. there any initial questions or comments from board members? Joe? Um, hear comments from, yep. um, and then we could ask questions. Yep. Okay, After thank that. you. Yep. Okay, are there any questions or comments from the audience? Please just go up to the mic and state your name and where you, your address. Okay, Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Um, I like the idea of parking on the road. Um, part of our master plan is focused on preserving rural character. I feel like these parking bans that are popping up all over the town um, are urbanization. Um, I also feel like these small business owners, uh, whether you like them or not, I feel like we need to do what we can for small business owners, not make it more difficult for their customers. If you've ever gone to that location, uh, it, the parking lot fills up really quickly. Um, I feel like we should be establishing parking there, uh, you know, by right, and let people park there. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Hi, um, I'd like to say... Can you say your name and address, please? Sorry. Um, my name is Nihar Sinapati. I'm from 29 Strawberry Hill Road. Okay. Um, I got this motion, but I was not very clear. Uh, does it prevent the residents to also... If there are guests from the residents, uh, let's say there is a party, birthday party or something, there are six or eight cars coming in, and obviously all the driveways are not equipped to handle the eight, nine cars, so a few cars might be parking along the road. Would that be okay if, uh, if does this motion allow for that kind of exigencies? Uh, no, under this proposal, it's a, it's a parking prohibition uh, for everyone along that stretch of the road. Okay. Well, uh, then uh, I think there should have been, uh, because there, are rest, there are is a commercial traffic uh, at the entry point of the road, but that should not really put the other residents at convenience, at inconvenience, because the commercial traffic, as everybody here knows, has been creating a lot of missions um, in terms of the traffic congestion and obstruction, as well as the indiscipline. And that should not really put the residents at the inconvenience, but if somebody, if a resident like me has to choose between the two tables, then I would support the uh, traffic prohibition, and with the exception that if there is a clause uh, that allows for the residents to park on occasional uh, uh, situations. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm thank not sure if we can write the rules, how, how we would exactly allow an exemption like that, because you'd have to have some sort of guest permit system or something, otherwise it would be hard to know you know, when a resident's having a party and that's why a car is there versus a car is there for, but maybe you could think about the timing of it, perhaps. Yeah, you can think about the timing, uh, for example. That could be a, that could be a good idea. And because the, there, are, there are patterns for the restaurants and other commercial establishments. Obviously, they come in every day except for one or two days of uh, closer time, uh, closer uh, days. But for the residents, it will be usually weekends. Uh, so that is very occasional. So some kind of timing or some kind of conditionality can be reflected in, and that will really help the residents along the road. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Anybody else? Yeah. 
Hello. Hi. David Didrickson, uh, 25 Lincoln Drive. I'm also a member of the EDC committee and a uh, former business owner in town for 25 years, uh, Willow Books. Um, my, my business side feels very strongly that um, we need to do whatever we can to support small businesses. Uh, it's difficult enough. Uh, sometimes even a small change in your business condition can be enough to tip you over the edge. And I think we want to encourage small businesses. So my initial concern with this is, is for the small businesses that will be affected. Um, but in looking at it, I mean, it seems to me we t we're talking about making something permanent that was kind of arbitrarily put in place by um, an unelected official, sorry. Um, it seems to me like that road's been there for like over 100 years and people managed to get back and forth. We understand that it's a cut through road that people want to avoid the rotary and I get that. I think there's a case to be made for a study of the traffic conditions to see, um, you know, what things could and could not be done, what exceptions could be made for certain residents or certain occasions. I'm just concerned with the process here because as I understand it, this was all brought about by a single complaint by a citizen and then was brought forward to the police chief who has the authority to put a temporary ban in on his own, on his just decision, you know. And it may be in fact that that is a good thing to do in this road. But it may also be that it's an arbitrary decision that shouldn't be rushed into. Uh, you're going to affect a lot of people on a, a rate road that is used by a lot of uh, businesses and residents. And I just think just uh, rushing into making it official just because somebody, just some one person said, yeah, it seems unsafe to me after all these years. Um, I think that's the wrong way to go. I think it sends a very bad message to people all over the town and also to the businesses that are, you know, feeling, um, you know, might feel a little bit uh, victimized and singled out. And uh, I can think of many other places in town where you could, you know, apply the same standards. And so maybe it would be a good idea to establish those standards, figure out what things we really do look at, not just can somebody, can I have a permit once in a while for something? I mean, it might be a good idea to actually study those places in town uh, where you might want to consider a permanent ban. I just think that the process of having one person come in and go, I don't like it, make it a temporary ban, and then just rubber stamping it and ramming it through just seems uh, the wrong way to go to me. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else wishing to speak? Okay. Yep, you just walk up. Uh, hi, my name is Peter. I'm here on behalf of Rep Scallion. Um, I guess to follow up the two prior people, um, unfortunately I've been here a few times, probably in the last few years, in front of you folks. Uh, this one, you know, I guess as much as it can be discouraging, some of the things that happened over the years, this one, um, you know, we're all about safety um, at that location as we are there seven days a week. Um, our employees, you know, we have 50 employees, not all of them work at that location, but we have dozens of employees daily who cross over Strawberry Hill Road and Great Road to go to Donnellan's where we park our employee lot because um, the Gould family, which is another terrific business family here in this community, allows us to park there. Uh, so when we bring up concerns over the years of safety and us crossing Great Road and Strawberry Hill Road, and we've actually had the incident reports, we have the facts, we've seen accidents there firsthand. We've called first responders firsthand ourselves from the five Strawberry Hill address on accidents that are created through cut through, not on, not on behalf of Rapscallion. Um, but when we raise those concerns, there's, you know, there's, really, there's very little feedback. Uh, we've had some support in some of the committees, Selby's committees and Roland's uh, department, I should say. Uh, that's great and all, but you know, it's just an email. Um, so when I hear that this was brought up uh, by a neighbor who lives two plus miles, he lives past Pope Road, um, way up on the, on the hill. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe he's here tonight. Uh, so if it was brought up by him, um, you know, I, I just don't understand uh, the argument. So yes, we, we do park on the um, side of Strawberry Hill a handful of times a month. Uh, we're not gonna deny that. We have 30 parking spots and 75 seat capacity occupancy uh, license, which the fire departments, building departments and town of Acton um, submitted. And this goes back to my father-in-law who's had a restaurant there since 1969, uh, or I'm sorry, 76, who's here tonight as the landlord. So again, it's, you know, I get these things and I think as David says, we, we're just business owners trying to 
do a community thing, employ people, move forward, and, and these things constantly come up, and, and we want to go the right way, and, and I, I think he's got a point, you know. Um, the police chief and uh, Corey, they have every right, apparently, to do what they like, but to me, I scratch my head when I don't see, you know, facts or reports, or it's just kind of like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe they don't like that corner of the street, maybe they don't like the opera, who knows? They say, let's put up temporary signs. So I've, I've had a lot of neighbors, including the one you posted up there. Uh, we have another couple neighbors on Lady Slipper who have sent me emails, and I can forward those. So I, I feel like there's, you know, they're happy the few times a month we do park, uh, I would say, five to ten cars on that one side because it does slow down traffic. That's a very busy cut through. Uh, and again, I don't, don't want to sound like a broken record, but... We're there every day. I'm there. I park sometimes. Uh, we always have a dedicated parking person there. Uh, so the argument of emergency vehicles not getting by, I just, I mean, I'm there. If I'm not parking there, I have an employee there. And we always go off to the left. There's, there's substantive space for uh, emergency vehicles to get through. Um, and the traffic's much slower. Um, so I, I think, I, I don't know uh, why the gentleman uh, on Starby Hill Road, I believe his name is Mr. Vio, uh, complained. Um, as he lives two miles up. And the only thing I can think of is when we do park on that side of Strawberry Hill, the few cars we park there, sometimes because it's so busy, you have to wait a little before a car gets around. Um, if the worst, you know, I'd rather be safe at that corner and not have a fatality that could happen one day versus just having to wait two minutes for a car to get around another car as there's two-way traffic. Uh, that I do see is annoying, but again, we have a parking person there and we usually make it pretty seamless. Uh, so until we, you know, internally find another solution, um, you know, we, again, we're gonna have to use uh, those, possibly those spots a few times a month. Um, and uh, that's, I think, all I have, so. Okay, great, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, anyone else? Right. Yep. Um, Rihanna Lenoy, 19 Strawberry Hill Road. Um, I am in favor of the parking ban. It uh, has been lovely having to be able to pull out of my driveway without any areas of concern of <laughs> getting T-boned because I can't see around cars. Um, it's more than just once or twice a month that was happening on a daily basis that cars were parking on the street. Um, they were parking on both sides. Employees are parking on the street right across from my driveway, uh, right in front of my driveway, um, where we came down to find out if it was an employee, because it had a broken window. My boyfriend was gonna call the cops because he thought the car had been broken into. Um, but it's an employee that pretty much parks there daily. Um, but it has no longer been happening, and it's been enjoyable. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi. Um Again, this is Nihar from 29 Strawberry Hill Road. I think it's a better growth point. And I, unfortunately, I couldn't reinforce that in my previous communication or um, <coughs> past few days, it has been blissful. And we don't want to get that, we don't want that peace to be get disrupted again by allowing the traffic on both sides of the road. It is for everybody who goes through a Strawberry Hill Road, and I can get the signature enough and people, some people are not here. Some people have already shared the videos, the pictures. That is with the town planning um, department. And um, we don't, the peace that has prevailed in the last few days, don't want to, I don't want that peace to go away or fade away. At the, at, just for the uh, benefit of the few or one or two establishments there. This is, this is my humble request to consider the residents' um, peace, safety, and the kids, those are living along the Strawberry Road. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a way to like actually establish some spots off to the side of the road and maybe slow the speed limit because the people are screaming through there. And I can't imagine if that's pleasant for anybody except for the speeder. Um, and I think that we have the right to reduce the speed limits, and so it's something we could do. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, uh, cool. oh, sure. Yep. Uh, 
I would be in favor if there were established sections of you can park from this corner to that corner and on one side of the street. I think that would be acceptable as a compromise for the safety of the residents getting in and out of their driveway and not getting killed. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions or comments from board members? Uh, Joan? Yeah, Corey, why both sides? Why not just one side? Uh, the police department was concerned about um, sort of one-way traffic getting through and the sight lines around curves um, and the sort of the knoll. Uh, the fire department was concerned about um, turning radiuses in and out of the apartments. I assume that would be more, probably more to do with vehicles parked on, let's say, the sort of the Concord side. Um, I assume that would limit their ability proximity of cars parked on the other side closer would maybe limit the turning radius, but I would think more so would be on the, on the town of Concord side of Strawberry would be their concern. Thanks. Okay. John? Yes. Um, uh, for Mr. Daniel, please, if you might step So, in. so normally we don't, it's not, <laughs> we're not in a court show, so okay. we don't, we can't command people to stand up. If you have a question, you can ask in if somebody in the audience okay. wants to answer and I allow it, I can't, <laughs> but we're not, we're no longer in a court. Well, you, you, you could read up, it's a proper. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, um, you had um, um, stated that um, it's only a couple of times a month that your customers park on Strawberry Hill Road. Yeah, I would conservatively say once a week, but no more. Uh, okay. But I think if you look at the track record, it, it's probably fewer than that. But, you know, I want to put facts and have humility like the, the lady there. I mean, I, I agree that we need it to be safe when you get it in on your driveway. But if we're concerned about a parked car, which I know for sure, I'm, I'm sure it was a customer. Employees have a strict policy, and I'm, I'm there every day. Uh, so unless, please feel free to give me their name and their license plate if you can supply that, be, uh, but I will say 100% sure, I'm sure it was a customer, but I think a parked car, to me, I'd be a little more concerned about safety, about a commuter cut through cars flying through there at 56 miles per hour versus a parked car, but uh, I would think a parked car would slow traffic down. Um, but I, I, yes, your answer, sorry. In, in, in terms of your customers parking there the once a week, um, what days of the week is, would that generally be? Uh, it, it's it's tough. It's really when we have like um, again, it's 30 parking spots um, at the restaurant, and we have capacity for uh, 75. So if we have a company party, for instance, where you have 20 uh, business people, they're they're not going to carpool most likely. So they all take their own car, and then we have a busy night. So when it does happen, it's usually a Friday night or a Saturday night. Those are the only two nights it happens. And I and I think it is it would be a good compromise, and that's what we're we were looking forward to seeing reports, facts. If maybe we allocate three or four spots on the right side so we, we don't get in the way of uh, the lady that owns, uh, who is just up here that's on 19, or we're not in the way of the gentleman who, who lives on 29. Uh, it's very rare that it goes that far up on Starby Hill Road. It's usually right at the corner um, as you turn right, and, you know, we're not, you know, and that's the one corner I would think, too, we'd want cars to slow down in, in safety because we've had some accidents here over the last few years. And, and again, I know, you know, I keep saying this, but we... You know, our, we have a strict policy. All our employees park at Donnellan's. Uh, you can look at the camera feeds. You can speak with the Gould family. So we, we cross that road, both roads, Great Hill Road and um, Starby Hill Road daily. Um, so it's uh, it's been a concern, especially later at night when it's dark out, uh, really any time of the day, especially during a commuter cut through. Um, so I, I find the irony that, you know, I've got no problem with uh, NIMBY personalities. I mean, it's going to happen, uh, right? It's um, But when we have a, you know, I will listen to a, an NIMBY personality if um, we can all look at it from both sides. And uh, the irony is some of these same people who don't want uh, cars there based on safety come flying through that um, intersection. So apparently it's, they just want it at their convenience and maybe not at the safety of others. So if we can all kind of look at this from both sides, maybe we can come to a solution. So, so on, on those uh, Fridays and Saturdays that you will have customer parking on, on, Strawberry, on, on Strawberry Hill Road. How many parkers would you have on average, or what would be the range? Yeah, so we, we always have, uh, and on our staff schedule, uh, we literally schedule our front of the house, pack of the house, runner, busser, expo, and we actually have a title for parker 
Uh, so that, that's how serious, obviously, we take this. Uh, so we have someone every day there. If that person's not there, I'm, as the owner, I'm there parking cars. So um, every time I'm there, when we've had these handful of times a month where we do need to park on one side of Starbury Hill Road, again, I would say no more. You know, there, don't get me wrong, there was a few times in the last four years where it went all the way up the street. And I remember Household Goods had a big annual charity. Um, Nature Connection had a big annual charity. So when we do these big annual charity events where we literally uh, have all these people come um, and do, sometimes we do day burn, or sometimes we they just you know take the whole, we close the public and they take the whole house over. You know, that's 75 different cars coming. So th those few times a year, I've seen them go as far as uh, 29 past Dean Croak's uh, house. So, you know, I've never seen him at the corner of, at the fork way up, uh, but I do know if a handful of times in the last four years we've had more than 10. But sorry, the long, short answer is uh, it's it's rarely past 10 that we have on that side. And you would have a an assistant on duty out there to... Absolutely. We, we always have someone there. Um, they're in, uh, you know, the reflection gear at nighttime, and, but there, there's always someone parking. Uh, it, it rarely goes on, you know, and it, it's for our business as well. And that's the, part of the whole problem is I normally wouldn't mind if we had a safe way to cross Strawberry Hill Road in a, an overflow parking lot that the town um, would uh, approve. But part of the whole reason why I'm, I'm asking just for this, well, one for the temporary signs to come down and, and no permanent signs is there are a few times a month um, that we, we need these extra spots. It's that or I turn away customers and as a small business. And I and I know when Mr. Vio, who, who lives on the Castle Hill, called me, um, he said, oh, you're doing so great down there. And it's like, you know, I'm glad he knows my business very well, but, you know, we have Tuesdays, Wednesdays, that we have no one coming in. You know, we're not in the city. Our lunches are going to be slow. Uh, so it's not like, you know, everything's gravy, you know, biz, we're full house every day of the week, you know, set 24-7. It, it's, it's just not accurate or, or factual. So those few nights I have a private party and maybe we're open public, you know, those are the few nights that maybe I could be at full capacity. We need those nights. We need those Friday, Saturday nights to, to um, keep going. So those are the few times if we have to turn customers away, we turn them away with permanent parking. That's fine. You know, we've, we've kind of rolled with the punches here with the town and, you know, we're not. Uh, oh, well, we're not. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're not complaining. It's just uh, you know. Okay. Sorry. Jeremy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I see some people wanting to speak. I'm just going to say this, and this is why we don't normally do this. So unless you have something drastically new to say, I understand that there are differences in opinion into how frequently this happens and how many cars there are, and and we all recognize that. Um, so unless you have something that's uh, completely new, but first I'm going to let other board members speak. So Janet. Um, I live up on the hill off of Strawberry Hill Road, but I have a, a good view out of my house, of Mr. Veo's house, so I know uh, where he lives. Um, I would guess, no, the parking situation doesn't affect him where he's, his residence is, but it certainly is going to affect him if he's driving down Strawberry Hill Road, as I do, to go anywhere. Um, uh, there have been some nights, I often have meeting nights, uh, night meetings every, every three nights in a row, and I know starting Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, the, the cars start lining up on the streets. Um, and and I, my one thought is, okay, first of all, I think that your business obviously needs more parking uh, uh, for the customers that you draw. It's great that your business is doing well. Um, the parking is an issue. Um, I think that for residents, when there are special parties and things like that, people do typically uh, spill out onto the streets where they live, in the case of Strawberry Hill Road, that's Strawberry Hill Road. Um, but you know, if that's an occasional thing, it would be good if we could have some flexibility to allow for people who are residential uh, to be able to go out on the road, now, understanding that it's maybe once a year. And if they're smart, they're going to they're going to schedule their parties in fair weather when there isn't a big snow bank that's pushing the car, you know, in the middle of the road and creating an obstacle, traffic obstacle. Um, I am concerned about other residents and that their driveways be un unblocked. Um, they should be able to get in and out of their driveways without being impeded by badly parked cars along the street. So I am sort of thinking that a solution where you had a section of street where it was okay to park on one side of the street, not in the winter, would be one possible 
um, less harsh uh, solution. Um, the trouble is, is in the winter, because I, it, it will be impossible to allow people to park on one side of the street, because then you have a very narrow lane, which will be difficult for even a small car like mine to get through. If you have, if we had snow piled up on either side, then it would be incumbent upon the town to clear everything to the, to the, you know, to the side, to the walls, or whatever it is that's on the side of the streets. And that's really um, not, it shouldn't be the, co the town's obligation to clear the, the streets so that you can have parking on the street when it's clearly not safe to do that. I mean, all the overflow customers would have to park in Donnellan's, assuming that uh, they're willing to have people park there. So, I mean, I see a lot of issues. I have been, and this is all in fair weather, where the parking is along the street. I have come down Strawberry Hill Road, where there were cars parking on, well, on the restaurant side of the street, and I've had to wait for the car, a car coming out of the parking lot, the regular parking lot, to get out, and another car to get in, and then so that then, and then the traffic uh, so clear, to clear so I could get by the parked cars to make my way. Coming back from a meeting, I remember one time, I was stuck on Great Road. I couldn't, I couldn't turn onto Strawberry Hill Road because there was a backup of cars dealing, coming out of the parking lot, going in. Um, you know, it, it was just a problem, and it would be good if we could figure out a way to solve that. I do think that if we took a little more time to study what's going on there and consider all the needs of the business and the neighbors, I think it would be, and, and the people who have to use, you know, I'm not driving there through street. It's the way I go to get to town hall and a lot of other places in town. I'm not using it as a pass through, believe you me. If I, there are people who commute who use it and they fly, yeah, they fly up Strawberry Hill Road, uh, uh, speeding much faster than that narrow road would allow. But, you know, it is a narrow road and so, you have to consider it's not like Mass Ave, where there's, there's room for parking on the sides of the road and everything. We barely have room for sidewalks on parts of Strawberry Hill Road. So, um, so I would suggest a little more time. Um, I mean, I would be happy to provide comments about what I've observed as somebody who uses the road uh, and lives some distance away but is sympathetic to the business and the residents. Um, I don't think it's acceptable as one person said, to have parking on the sides of the road unrestricted because it is, it is a narrow road. And if you don't have to use that road every day, you have no idea how um, it's dangerous, it's inconvenient, and uh, it's not acceptable as far as I'm concerned for everyday use. Um, but anyhow, I'd like to have a little more flexibility uh, to allow for, say, um, exceptions. And I don't know if there's, if we were to, set aside a portion of the road for parking and that proved not to be sufficient if then we could, I don't know if there's a permit, you know, special permit where you're allowed and you have all, all of the guests have to have placards to show that they're allowed to park temporarily there for, I don't know, four hours or whatever the duration is, uh, something like that. But I, I think it's not, it, we're not gonna solve the problem by just banning all the parking because, I, you know, I would like to be supportive of the business. I would also note that um, the business does, you know, it's the kind of business it is. Uh, it's parking lot's a small parking lot. It was great when it was a quaint little French restaurant um, where you didn't have um, all the traffic all week, at, especially at night. But it's a different kind of a business. It draws a different, um, on a different audience. And there are just a lot of cars. So, I, you know, I want to be supportive of business, but I also am very sympathetic to the residents in that area. So. That's, so I'm saying don't don't right. decide anything tonight. So okay, Peter. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Corey. Do, have you done any uh, traffic counts or anything out there? Do we? What kind of information do we have about what the average speed is or what? How much traffic goes through Strawberry Hill Road? Uh, the town engineer did a traffic study. I think about a year, or two, probably a couple of years ago. Um, it was further up the street by number 75. I think it was. The 85th percentile speed up that way um, was about 37 miles an hour, and I think there was a little over 2,000 cars a day that drove down that stretch. So 2,000 a day, does that make it a, a main artery or a feeder road? Or it makes it in the range of a, a collector road, something like uh, like you'd see Willow Street, streets like that where you see that's a pretty. I assume that's a pretty high number. Um, yeah, considering yes. other roads in town or whatever, 2,000 a day is, is a pretty high number. 
Or, yeah, I mean, you, if you look at something like the Main Street for comparison, um, in the center here, you're probably talking in the neighborhood of 18,000. Like Ooh. I said, um, Willow <laughs> Street. Um, I think of other streets that might be in that range, but it's a lot of those connector roads, probably um, the upper section of Parker Street where it's feeding into the, your, people are using them to get to some place, probably yeah. I would assume Piper Road or roads like that, yep. Okay, and, and this is actually the first time I've heard of a police chief's emergency authority, I guess, to ban parking. How, when did that go into effect and how long, how long does it stay in effect? Um, he has the ability to put up the temporary parking signs, but, um, okay. yeah. Um, you know, I, I, the first thing I got to say is um, Chief Burroughs, and now I hear Chief Hart has weighed in on this, um, are top-notch professionals. They, their responsibility is to protect the public safety in town. They don't make decisions based on whether they like intersections, they don't like intersections, and they I would bet, don't make decisions about one complaint from somebody who lives two miles away from uh, Rapscallion. So uh, their business is to protect the public safety in town. And I would depend on their opinion about whether banning parking is going to make the street less safe or not because people are going to go faster down the road than somebody who uh, is a non-expert in, uh, in, uh, in the traffic field. So. I got to stick up for our public safety officials. They make the right decisions for the public safety of the town. So um, on the other hand, there's not a lot of information we have here. We have nothing from Chief Hart. We have one memo of two paragraphs from Chief Burroughs that says, I believe for the safe passage of pedestrian, bicyclists, and motorists in that area, that vehicles should not be allowed to park on the side of the road between Great Road and Esterbrook Road. So I, I do agree that there, there ought to be more information provided before we make a final decision, I guess, on this. Um, and uh, what, what kind of uh, facts are they basing this on that, that uh, you know, they're making this recommendation, not just Chief Burroughs, but Chief Hart, too. If he thinks that emergency vehicles are in danger, you know, of getting to places they need to get on Strawberry Hill Road because cars are parked there, we should know that. Um, but as, as far as the... Um, Having a party on the street, maybe we give the chief uh, discretion. People, uh, like Janet says, there's kind of a special permit. He has some kind of standards, uh, you know, depending on the conditions, the type of the time of the year, whether there's snow piles along the side of the road, how many cars people are expected to be uh, parked on the side of the road, what hours, uh, you know, is two or three hours, four hours, five hours. If there are too many cars and it creates a public safety, um, maybe he could require, uh, require the, um, the uh, person who's given the party to hire a police detail or something like that. Um, that that's one thought I had, but um, I think we need a little more information, but in a time being, for the time being, um, if the chief thinks there ought to be no parking on either side, I would keep that in place until we make a decision. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I agree with your remarks. I, I was really uh, disappointed by sort of veiled um, uh, things said against the police chief and fire chief and, and Corey about how their decisions are made because they're not made in, you know, just out of their own minds or because of one person calling them. That's not true. These people work to um, promote the public safety in our town and that's exactly what they were trying to do in this situation. Um, but I also agree that, you know, I think we could go back and get more information and, and uh, talk to the chiefs and understand if there is a compromise about perhaps it's, you know, only allowing it on part of one side of the road, you know, for certain times of years, as Janet suggested, but I don't know what, what part of the road that would be to still allow the, you know, fire truck turning capacity and things like that. So I think the chiefs need to weigh in um, on, on that. Um, and if there is some sort of, you know, uh, temporary, uh, 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 permit you could get uh, for your guests or something like that, but I, creating a whole new program like that is, could be very difficult. So um, I don't know if that's worthwhile, but I think if we go back and look at it a little bit more, that would be um, my inclination, get a little bit more information and see if there's sort of a, a compromise solution there that the chief still, f still feel would, uh, you know, allow for the safety of that roadway, um, but without completely banning traffic on both sides of it all, all times of the year. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Yes, John. 
Yeah, it seems like there's um, you know, two levels of issues. A long-standing concern that Strawberry Hill is a cut-through street in the morning and in the evening with lots of cars going at high speeds back and forth. And then there's a, a second level of issue um, with Rapscallion, and let's try to keep that in perspective. I'm certainly a supporter of, of local businesses and all of the good work that Peter and his brother you know, have done um, with their, with their um, pub, um, that we're looking at really Friday and Saturday, um, uh, I guess late afternoons, evenings, um, street parking, maybe as many as you know, 10 people parked, with the assistance of a parking attendant. So I would, uh, I would join with my uh, uh, colleagues and let's defer on any action tonight and see if we could get some further information um, uh, from the uh, fire chief and the police chief. Okay, great. Joan, you had something to add? Yeah, no, I just would be in favor of parking on one side of the street at certain times. Okay. Um, okay, so it sounds like maybe, Corey, I don't think we have to take a vote, but if you could go back and see if there's some sort of compromise plan and bring it back, um, and I agree with Peter, it's up to the police chief's discretion about whether or not to keep those temporary bans in place um, in terms of the safety, and I'm supportive of that um, in the meantime. But do you feel like you have a good sense of kind of what we're looking for or hoping to maybe see for next time? Okay, great, excellent, thank you. All right, and you are up uh, again for the hazard mitigation plan update. Uh, this is Ann Hurst. She works for the MAPC. Uh, the town, when we entered into this process of updating our hazardous mitigation plan, uh, we partnered with the MAPC to help us through the process. So uh, Ann's been our main point of contact that's really helped us along and kept it moving. So I'll hand it over to her to go through. Okay. Well, thank you for the op opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, as Corey said, I've been working with a team of town staff uh, led by Corey and also including Selby. Uh, to, to update the town's hazard mitigation plan. Uh, it is a plan that needs to be renewed every five years, according to FEMA, who oversees the process. Uh, and uh, again, MAPC has been providing technical assistance uh, to revise the plan. And feel free to ask questions if you have them as I go along. Do I need to? Uh, right. There. I need to hit the right thing. <laughs> Um, so the Federal Disaster Mitigation Act was passed in 2000, and it set a goal for every municipality across the country to have a hazard mitigation plan. It's a goal. It's not actually a requirement, uh, but FEMA does have a, a carrot for compliance, and that is that in order to be eligible for FEMA mitigation grants, towns have to have the hazard mitigation plan. And many towns haven't participated in FEMA grant programs, but Acton has received a grant for culvert replacement uh, at Sumner Road and, and actually grants to do the, this plan originally and, and to renew it this time. And in each instance, uh, FEMA has paid 75% of the cost. Um, so this is a plan that addresses all kind of natural hazards. I think it's nice to be on our night when uh, <laughs> we're having thunderstorms and tornado warnings in Western Mass. It's perfectly appropriate. Um, you have other kinds of plans for chemical spills or terrorism. This is really about, about natural issues. Uh, and before this, there was really no way to look comprehensively at every natural hazard. So flooding is typically the most common, uh, but we look at things like high winds and tornadoes, um, winter storms with snow and ice, uh, even earthquakes and landslides, which are very low probability but not zero probability. Uh, drought, for example, is unusual, but we had a significant one in 2016 that can tend to lead to brush fire impacts. Um, I'm gonna, doesn't 
whoppering that well with me. Um, so basically the, the impetus for the plans is that across the country FEMA was seeing that there was this cycle of, of disaster with rebuilding and then the same disaster, the same damage in rebuilding in the same place. Um, so the goal really of these plans is to interrupt that cycle. Um, disasters are really costly both to taxpayers and private citizens. Um, they often, often involve a lot of human suffering. So it's important to analyze our vulnerabilities and, and address them before the next disaster. Um, so essentially, uh, MAPC in its role has, has pr probably provided updates for 85 communities in our region. We provide the technical assistance. Uh, the work that uh, is really, uh, the, the key part of the work is working with town staff. They're the ones who provide the, the important information that, that makes the plan meaningful. Um, so we, provide, we channel sort of information that town staff are able to provide into the FEMA required format, populate it with the information that FEMA requires. Um, we hold two public meetings. This is the second one. I appeared before the Conservation Commission uh, in April. Uh, so we now have a full draft plan. It's on the town's website. I'll, I'll show that link at the end of my presentation. Anybody who's interested uh, can submit comments. Uh, when it's finalized in the next couple weeks, we submit it to FEMA. They do a review. Uh, uh, MEMA does a first level review. FEMA does a second level review. And then it actually comes back to you, the, the board, for final approval. Uh, so um, essentially what we're looking to do is ID hazards and specifically map them to the town. So we do start with higher level regional data and then, and then work down to the town level for local information. Uh, so these are the, are the kinds of hazards you'll see mapping and we'll be able to provide uh, those maps in, in GIS use for the town for any other use you might have for them, what other kinds of planning. And obviously, we're, again, we're looking at, at everything from geology to wind and snow. Um, and then we also look at patterns of development. Uh, some future development may be in flood areas, some not. The land use team developed this list of, of potential upcoming development. It's obviously just a snapshot in time, but it's an opportunity to look at how those places relate to flood zones. I will note that this shows sort of percentage uh, in a flood zone. That means the the full parcel itself, it might not mean the actual building, depending on what's happening there. Uh, we also uh, worked with the town to identify all sorts of critical facilities. That includes disaster response sites, sites that could need services, places where people gather. And again, that's mapped and then overlaid with hazard areas. Um, so this is the full list of mitigation measures already in existence, and I certainly won't try and read them to you, but I did really want to give you a sense of the breadth of work that the town does in an ongoing way. Um, things from enforcing regulations to infrastructure projects to ongoing maintenance, land protection, public education. Um, the town is just really by no means starting with a blank slate, and, and certainly this is already a, a second plan. Uh, and then these are the new or continuing measures that the team chose to put in, in the next five-year plan. It's really the heart of the work. Um, you can see they're, they're classified by threat, and so projects might be physical infrastructure. They might be a regulatory strategy uh, having to do with land use. Some projects, like stormwater management, uh, will have other benefits for the town, for example, around compliance with MS4 stormwater requirements. Uh, and one thing I'd note is that the team added a new goal to the hazard mitigation plan this year, and that's to consider future climate impacts. Um, so things like flooding and drought and extreme temperature are predicted to become more frequent and severe in the future. So strategies to address those concerns will help act and be more resilient as, as potential weather conditions uh, become more severe. Uh, the team also participated in Acton's uh, recent municipal vulnerability uh, preparedness workshop. Um, at, that workshop was also coordinated by Corey York. Um, and the final suggestion in the slide uh, about uh, improving emergency communication is one that did come directly from, from out, out of that workshop. That was a high concern of the participants. Um, so next steps, as I said, is, is really to go through a review process. Uh, the, the draft plan will be on the town's website uh, until July 1st, uh, and people can submit comments during that time. Um, MEMA and FEMA will let us know if there are revisions needed, uh, but at some point uh, we'll circle back to you to ask for your final approval. Tonight is simply for information. Uh, FEMA wants the last step to be your approval once they have finally reviewed the plan. Um, and then also to note that, that it is a five-year plan, but, but FEMA really wants it to be a living plan, and so there's a, a sort of a, a maintenance uh, 
protocol in the plan that involves reviewing it and, and the process of, of updating it is somewhat lengthy. Um, so really starting to look at it probably in the fourth year in order to, to always have a plan in place will be necessary. Um, and then this is, uh, I just wanted to be able to show the, the link for where the plan is. Uh, and again, I'll take comments uh, by email or, or by phone any other way uh, up until July 1st. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions now. Great, thank you so much. Okay, any questions or comments from board members? Janet. On the floodplain map, what does AE mean? Uh, so AE, Is that a code or? It's a, it's a FEMA flood zone designation. Um, and it, I mean, it, it, it's not, it doesn't stand for something. Um, basically, FEMA has two basic flood zones. Uh, v would not relate here, they're coastal flood zones. So basically, an a, the way FEMA defines flood zones is they'll, they'll give it this AE designation and, and they'll provide an elevation. So if they say AE 10 feet, they're saying we, we expect that the you know, flood waters will reach 10 feet, which is not 10 feet above the ground, but whatever, but a, a 10 okay. foot elevation. And then when it says, it, because I was looking, say, where the schools are, some of the schools are, it said 25, AE 25% or AE zone 25%. I didn't know what that So was. what that I didn't is know if it was good, bad, or what. <laughs> well, so what that was indicating is that the par those parcels are 25% in that AE okay. flood zone. Okay. So if you, when, I know one of the possibilities is school combination. You presumably want to be looking at. Um, right what parcel is appropriate and whether placement, if 25% if is in a flood zone, then 75% isn't. So that is something you would you hope. Take, okay. take into account. And then my only other comment was that among the goals is you're looking for drought regulations for private well users. And, and I thought anything having to do with pri private well users is good uh, because I'm one of the 5% of people who aren't in the Acton Water District. We're not Acton Water District customers. so. Um, and it drives me crazy because I see the signs in Acton and Concord, you know, all the water district people have this restrictions in the summer and watering. And in my neck of the woods, they're just, you know, people have private wells and you have the people watering the street when it's raining outside with their sprinkler systems. And it just, and I'm, I, you know, we, I had this ongoing battle with my husband about our lawn. I said, it will, it will turn brown, just leave it alone. It will come back, or if it doesn't, it's bad, and I'll find something else to grow. But, you know, we just, I don't really irrigate anything except for new plants, you know, in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't survive, then they're out, and I replace them. So, um, and I, I would like to encourage more people uh, in our area to do that sort of thing, to be sort of drought sensitive even though we have a lot more water than say they have in, in California. So, or they have zero scrape, scape types of things which are interesting, so thanks. Okay, thank you. Much. Peter. Uh, yeah, my question had to do with some of the data um, and uh, whether it's current or not, and I don't know if you're building off a 2010 plan if you just continue to use that. But for instance, on page 13, it talks about the community profile it's got, according to the 2010 census, nearly 22,000 people live in Acton. There are 8,187 housing units. Uh, we have another item on our agenda tonight, the Regional Housing Services uh, Office that provides services to Acton. Um, there are, in fact, 8,475 uh, housing units in Acton. So I don't know if, you, if it's better for you to use more current data. I'm sure there's more than 22,000 people also that there were in 2010. Right. But. Well, for the, I mean, I, it, certainly if there's data the town would prefer we use, we can, we can swap out data. It, in terms of the census, we won't be able to, it's 2010 or right. not till 2020. Well, we have more current yeah. data though. It's not based on this. It, town does a census every year, yeah. so um, we certainly have that data. Yeah. But. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll, I'm happy to look at that. Generally, we, we use the census, but it's not that we couldn't okay. use it. I mean, I'm just, I, I just saw this for the first time Thursday night. Unfortunately, I missed the public forums. But on page 55, you've got, you know, a table of existing land use from 2005. I, I'm sure the town has more current information about that as well. But, yeah. Okay. Again, it's, that is state data that is slated right. to be updated, but hasn't been. So okay. it, it, you're right, it's, it's not. It's, it's the most current data of that type available, but we could look at other oh, possibilities. Okay. So then my only other question is really, this has come up in another context, and maybe you can answer it for me, but I'm, I'm understanding from another piece of work I'm doing that FEMA has two flood zones, zones, a 100-year flood zone and a 500-year flood zone. Is there such a thing as a flood plain as well? Does FEMA define a thing called a flood plain? 
Well, you, there, so you're right about the, the, hundred, the 100 year and the 500 years, those are sort of commonly known. There's also a flood way, which is, is really the, the primary stream or riverbed. Uh, the flood plain, I, I consider that to, usually people refer to that as, as that 1% or 100 year flood area. Um, okay. But I think flood plain is, is probably a less precise term. Okay, thank you. Great, Good thank job. You. Joe? No, my question was about private wells. <laughs> <laughs> John? No, I don't have any questions or okay. comments. Great. Um, well, I just want to start by saying thank you. It seemed like it was a lot of work to go through, so thank you all for doing that. I had a couple. One, um, I won't say I read this word for word super detailed, but I did notice that there's one errant reference to Littleton that should be in Acton that I think mm -hmm. was just, you guys probably reused for different towns. So. <laughs> um, so just checking through for that. Um, and then um, there are references in here to two meetings with the Board of Selectmen. I, it seems to me, because then there were also these references to you had one meeting with the Conservation Commission and then one with the Board of Selectmen, but then it seems to reference um, the two meetings with the board of selectmen, and now I'm not sure after your presentation is that referring to the one now, and then you'll have the one when it's ready to be approved, or is it really that CONSCON meeting and then this one? Because that it I was will, referred both ways in there, and I got a, I was like, I don't think we've seen this before. No, you, you <laughs> so haven't. I got a little so, confused. So I will check on that because I think it's okay. meant to refer to the conservation commission meeting. Because because when it when it comes back to you, it, it won't be a meeting. It will simply be a, a resolution Approval. for you to okay. adopt. So I, okay. I will check on that. Thank yeah. You. So I think just maybe clarifying that it was one with conservation commission, one one with the board of selectmen would be helpful. Um, and then I'd have to say I have to say when I was reading through this, I was starting to think, oh, you know, there's a lot of great stuff in here, but who's kind of in charge? of all of this and then it was really great to get to the section where you sort of laid out you know a specific staff members or departments that would be in charge of each goal or, or issue so I really appreciate that but my one question is Corey are you the one that's kind of in charge overall of the plan is there one designee kind of for the entire <laughs> plan and to make sure everybody who's assigned to these pieces is is doing that or I don't think it's been discussed, but okay. I've been kind of the point of contact, yeah. keeping it going. So I could be the evolution of the person just checking on making sure the steps are being taken. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, there were some really good, I think, concrete steps in here. So uh, and some that would require town meeting or or selectman changes or things like that. So just making sure we're, you know, kind of still working towards getting those all done with you know in the five years is or or longer, but. Uh, as many as possible in the five years would be really great. So, um, but otherwise, thank you very much for putting this together. And I will open up to public comment or questions. Yes. Um, Jim Snyder Grant, 18 Half Moon Hill. Um, so, just a little while ago, I sent some formal comments about the uh, the draft hazard mitigation plan to the board. It's probably too recently for you guys to have seen it. Um, and I will certainly forward those on to, to Ann and to Corey um, right away. Uh, I wanted to just summarize here uh, for the record and for those of you who are tired of, you know, reading all your emails. Um, so it was, it was a total delight to participate in that um, municipal vulnerability preparedness community resilience building workshop. Um, and there was a... Um, a really d a deep and multifaceted conversation, both from the presenters and from the small groups that we broke into about climate change. And so I, I was thrilled to see this um, goal nine added, uh, consider the potential impacts of future climate change and incorporate climate sustainability and resiliency in hazard mitigation planning. But then um, that, that meeting on May 9th was not even listed as a public meeting for this plan. Uh, I see now that it was described as a sort of a concurrent process that was happening. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think there's a, uh, at the very least, uh, the comments and information generated from that meeting should at least be comments in this plan because they set us in a, in a new direction about thinking about uh, climate change and hazards uh, that, was, that was very compelling to the people at that workshop. Um, I wanted to give a brief overview of some of what that meant to give us a jump start on um, incorporating sustainability, climate sustainability and resiliency 
in uh, hazard planning. Um, this is where I'm going to try to summarize, because this, this goes on for like nine points. Um, so climate change, uh, as Anne was noting, is going to mean a lot more uh, droughts punctuated by large storms. So we're headed for a much stronger potential for water supply emergencies. Uh, water supply issues, as we've discussed here many times, are regional issues. So we urgently need to find a way to work effectively with Concord and Littleton on um, Nagak Pond uh, supply issues in case we, we need that supply quickly. Um, and if there is a regional drought, uh, all the towns at once are going to want water. So planning now uh, is what we need to do, not waiting until we need it. Um, most of the material at the workshop was talking about first order climate effects. You know, climate changes are weather changes. But Acton's a pretty small town in the middle of regions and a planet. They're also being affected by climate change. So if we're going to take the impacts of climate change seriously, we also have to think about second order impacts. Uh, I've mentioned a few. Um, one is that uh, with flooding, you're going to have people no longer able to live along the coast who are living there now, particularly in the really crowded areas of Boston. So we're likely to see an influx of what we would call climate refugees uh, over the next few decades. Um, so we need to plan for that um, in, our, in our housing plans. Um, another thing that happens with climate change is that um, systems that are uh, at all fragile are seriously challenged by the changes brought on by climate change. So we're likely to see disruptions in the supplies of energy, uh, materials, food, and so on. So planning ahead about um, uh, creating a situation in which uh, the town of Acton and the region has enough area, for example, to grow the food it needs is, is wise and difficult. Uh, so that means the planning needs to start now. Um, The other thing that's likely to happen is a second order impact, either because of policy changes or because of shortages or both, is that fossil fuels are going to be a lot more expensive. Um, so um, we started in some directions for planning for a future where fossil fuels are, are difficult or expensive, but there's a lot more to go, um, and that uh, needs to be part of our planning. Um, and there's obviously a lot of ways to do that, which I won't list. Um, some, of the, some of the MVP workshop that was really fascinating for me and for a lot of people there focused on the map and geography and identifying particular areas of concern. So uh, I wanted to mention a couple. Um, um, so with the increased risk of flooding, when I see uh, hazardous materials stored near water supplies and um, public streams, it's... It, it, has me shaking. So when I see places like, uh, for example, Bursaw, storing a lot of fossil fuels right there next to the Shoba Brook and right near next to a zone one well, I think that's a situation that, because they're there by right and by permit, we can't change right away. So getting that hazardous material out of that area is, is again, going to take time and cooperation. That has to start now. Um, I think that's enough for now. The, the, more, the, the complete comments are being sent to you guys, and um, I'll try to get them up on the Green Act and website as well so that uh, the public can see them too. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. And I had meant to mention, this builds off a little bit of what Jim was talking about, about flooding, is that it was good, I don't know if it was good timing or one of those that now I'm thinking about the issue, and so I, I hear, you know, I, you hear it more, um, and people have been talking about it all along, but there was a good story um, that I only heard part of this morning on WBR about um, a study out around um, the um, impact of flooding uh, due to increased climate change and the... Um, uh, anticipated impacts of that on a number of the coastal communities, including a lot of, as Jim mentioned, cities like Revere and Quincy and the um, impact that's going to have on the housing there and how much of the, they were talking specifically about the decrease in the 
property value due to um, flooding issues uh, and the impact that will have on communities as well. So while that might not, you know, we're, we're not on the coast and we're not probably gonna experience that right away, but we will have a lot of people that can no longer live in these densely populated areas um, that are gonna need other places to live and communities are gonna have to deal with this in, in a number of ways, including those, it was just an interesting take on the impact on property taxes um, in particular. So it's hopefully, I think, a lot of different ways to open people's eyes to uh, to these issues. So anyways, I'm hoping to find the full uh, <laughs> part of that. I only heard some of it this morning, but yes. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions and then some comments. The Gates School Metrics, can you walk us, can you put that slide back and walk us through that? The, there were some numbers after the 25%. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Is this where we are? Um, yeah. The schools, is that what you're asking about? I guess that when you say elementary schools, I guess you were looking at. There's more details in the plan here, but this is not this well, is not the time to talk specifically about the site for the gate school or the no, train I know. school. No, I know, I just want to understand the, the numbers that they've got in this, the columns. The 1% annual and the 10.64%. Can you just explain what that means? So if you're reading across, it says 23% is in the 1% flood zone. 10 per, uh, and 10 percent is in the regulatory floodway, so that's sort of the, the closest okay. to the stream. Thank you. Um, and again, I, I, I myself would have to look at, back at the plan. I think that might have been looking at multiple parcels, yeah, okay. um, but it was it sort of saying, you know, this is something to be aware of. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks. So in it's terms an of average. placement. Yeah. Um, the next question is: um, th I didn't notice anything in there about continuing to approve projects in flood zones. Um, I thought that might be something to mention because it seems to be a practice. Uh -huh. but, uh, and uh, then that leads me to the FEMA maps uh, because there seems to be these observable flood zones that are well beyond what the FEMA maps have. And I don't know if it's because they're old or because they got modified by developers, whatever it is. I feel like we need to respect what we can see and the River Street, there's areas in town where, where we know it's floods. And so I feel like we need to be respectful of that. That actually uh, is, is very much part of this hazard mitigation process. If you, when you look at the plan, you'll see in the mapping at the end, one of the things, again, that the town committee did was identify areas of hazard. Flood, certainly one, could have been brush fire, other kinds of things, but basically circling places. This area floods, this area floods may or may not be in a flood zone, isn't always. So we should ask people who know about these observable flood zones to turn them in and to tell you guys about it. Sure. Is that right? Okay. I mean, it happened also in the, I think people did some of that in the in the MVP workshop, and I, and I, I guess I'd like to make a plug that we're doing uh, on June 28th, there'll be an open meeting here to talk about the MP, MVP workshop, summarize what happened, and also get people's input, so that, that's another chance. Okay, okay so it's that. Uh, then, I feel like the draft is proact is reactive, so it seems to like accommodate human impact, and as it, uh, Jim pointed out, it doesn't, uh, doesn't like, there's nothing in there about like, hey, let's reduce the human impact and do our share, you know, just like you do your share for the migration, we do our share for lessening the impact of humans on the environment and reducing fossil fuels and things like that and have it be a mandate as part of a resiliency plan, because we are doing a lot of that. Uh, I think that we stand as an example to the towns that aren't. It's also single event oriented, it seems. Um, like the human aspect of it is shelter beds. You know, let's react to this, you know, hurricane. And instead I feel like long-term sustainability is part of resiliency too. The food security, um, I'm particularly concerned about, Jim had mentioned it, but the number of acres per person, we have already reduced the number of acres per person so that we're actually behind major cities. So major cities have more land preserved per capita than Acton does, despite all of our wonderful efforts. And so the more years that we let, you know, however many 60, 80 acres get developed at the same time we're preserving one or two, we're getting further and further behind the eight ball. Um, the migration figures that um, MAPC has been putting out is in the order of like 3,000 per town. Is that correct? I want to make sure I understood. I'm not sure what it's you're referring to. 50,000 people moving out past the Arlington space. Is that right? I, I, don't, I don't know those figures. I would love for you guys to actually 
do some quantitative, even if it's just guessing and these are preliminary, for us to understand how many people are coming. Do you, do you mean climate related? Climate related because um, there was an article in the Globe that said it might be 1.5 million instead of the okay. 150,000 that MAPC is currently saying. Okay, I don't think MAPC is, to my knowledge, we haven't done an analysis of climate migration. Okay, I, I, could okay. Be wrong. I heard somebody say something. All right, uh, then it, water risks in terms of the toxins, but also the quantity. So mm -hmm. what we seem to be doing is we seem to be limiting people's water use but not limiting the water hookups for new development. So we don't seem to be taking care of ourselves or the people that are most vulnerable before we're taking care of developers. Um, and then that leads into my almost last question uh, comment. The focus is on property and infrastructure and doesn't seem to um, call for networks of people. Um, I have friends that are working on the Cambridge one and they're calling for bike delivery systems for food and meals and library books and I think that would be interesting to, to, to echo because the more towns that put that stuff in, the more popular it grows. Um, and then I already said about facilitating growth, regulating the well use, doesn't seem to be focusing on the environment but it seems to be focusing on allowing more water hookups. So it's a water taking for profit over people. Um, and then the last thing I had to say is that um, the, we have a lot of waivers for things like stormwater, um, and I feel like you can't wave water away. And so um, I feel like we have to stop having waivers for the stormwater X, um, I've just noticed like five or something like that, is that right, in the last, since we enacted it, which was one year? Anyway, to, to, to pay attention to those things and respect that, that waiving them because you know they're nice, friends of the town or whatever, affordable something, that we still have, the water is going to have to go someplace. So, thank you. Great. Okay, any other comments from the audience? Okay, and do you guys need anything from us tonight, or this was just a information update? Okay, great. Well, thank you again very much for all the work you put into that, and we'll keep an eye out once it comes back to us. So, okay. thank you so much, Ann. Thank you for your time. Okay, and um, Corey, I think finishing up <laughs> you tonight is the transfer station bag replacement and cost. Going back to the pay as you throw program that we've done, uh, we implemented it back in 2015 in the fall. Um, we've had we've had good success with the program so far. Um, we've had good um, sort of enrollment with it and con continuing um, doing the right thing. Uh, so as, as you know, the pay as you throw program that we use goes through a, um, a bag system. We the cost of the bag that you're buying is covering the actual material cost of the bag, but also covering the cost of the handling of that material. So as you can see, we, we offer three kinds of bags, um, an eight gallon, the 15 gallon, and 30 gallon. Uh, the most popular one that we buy is, people are buying is the 30 gallon. Uh, we originally chose that size in speaking with communities and the vendors. Um, it was a size that people felt comfortable, didn't get too, too heavy, that people could lift it out of your car or put in the transfer station. Um, as we've gotten into the as we've gotten into the program, um, the good thing is, is you'll see the upper two lines with sort of the two years prior, and then when we implemented the program, uh, we, we saw our, um, about a 36% 36, 36 reduction in the trash, and these are sort of the three years of the program since we've implemented it. That green line there, that was the start of the program, so that was sort of the, the uprise of the sort of cleaning out before the program started. Um, so it's it's been good. I mean. The good thing is we, we've seen a slight reduction in the stickers, but the reduction in the trash kind of far outweighs what we've seen that way. Um, so it's gone well. Um, I'd say the, the different comments and the feedback that we've gotten back, the one that we've, we continually hear from a lot of people is the size of the 30-gallon bag. Um, most people that speak with us, um, their desire for the 30, for the large bag is to line their trash barrel and then put, toss their kitchen trash bags into it and then come to the dump. Um, the 30 gallon is just slightly small enough. I 
I've tried it on my trash barrel and I'm able to get it on, but it is a very tight fit and it doesn't necessarily touch the bottom. Um, and a lot of people were commenting about the size bags that Littleton had and a couple other communities. So um, those communities are using 33 gallons. So there's slightly, a little bit wider, a little bit uh, taller. So we've, what we did was in speaking with our vendor, we, we ordered a, like two or three cases of a 33 gallon bag. The staff down there handed it out to people that he was speaking with that were, had a desire to have a larger bag. And um, I think predominantly everybody was in favor of that size. And what we were doing is we were measuring trash barrels <laughs> that we could find to see roughly what it was and trying it out. I mean, there's a few that they're just not gonna fit. They're just much larger, but the, I'd say the sort of the, the traditional barrels you see that are the 32 gallon. Um, it's still a snug fit going over the top but it generally holds it, so if you're dumping your trash into it, it holds so it doesn't collapse in, um, and it is touching the bottom of the barrel, so um, it was generally well received by sort of the small pilot program that we just put out just to see what the people thought was. So um, we were, what we were proposing to do, um, right now we still have an inventory of 30 gallon bags, so if you were okay with it, what we're gonna do is sort of run that 30 gallon sort of bag inventory down and then we'll replace those with a 33 gallon. Uh, when we looked at the numbers and the cost of that, um, the 33 gallon bag would be about $1.75 per bag for the sort of the extra three gallons of trash for the weight. So we're sort of here tonight to request that and see what you Great, thanks Ray, and just before I yep. open to questions, I just want to confirm we're, we're not, you, normally we have one meeting a year where we kind of approve the whole costs for the transfer station, yes. but we will do that later in the summer. Yeah, we'll still yeah, so maintain want, the same system. Yes. Exactly, yep. so I just want to, if people had questions about that, we will have another meeting on that. Um, okay, questions or comments from board members, Janet. So what, how long do you think it will take to run down the 30 gallon bag supply? When I spoke to them, um, about three weeks ago, I think they had a, they had about a 16 week supply. Um, they, they have sort of the normal process where they, they don't want to get too low and then they can't get the manufacturer in line. So I have to check with them again to make sure they didn't produce more, but they knew we were considering this tonight. So they, they might try to hang on a little bit just so they don't produce a, a mass supply and then we're stuck right. for a month. So. Well, I don't care because I, I have a, um, almost intact supply of 30 gallon bags that I never used because I use my favorite size is the eight gallon bag, it fits in the kitchen. Box. And then sometimes I, I have Donalyn's bags that I can't use and I empty the trash, the basket, because I put all our, our, our food scraps in a bucket in the freezer and I compost it. Or I take the other bucket, I have a little bucket, other bucket in the freezer, I take that to the transfer station. So this is a history I have going back to my parents because we, my father was determined to keep the animals out of the, the garbage. And the only solution he found that worked was to, was to keep the food out of the, the garbage cans. And so it started when I was a kid and I've continued with it, but it works pretty well. But I, as a result, I mean, I just don't have that. We don't ge generate that much trash. So I use eight gallon bags every couple of weeks. I go to the transfer station and, and 15 gallon bags. I just, sometimes I consolidate things and then I feel bad. I'm using it two eight gallon bags and sticking them into it. What a waste of money. But you know, it just, uh, it's, it's a great system. So I, mean, I, I will never use the 33 gallon gallon bag. I have the 30 gallon bag hangs kind of on three corners in our trash barrel and every once in a while my husband, he throws everything in there and I get angry at him because I say I don't want to use too many of them. You know, I want to save the, the big bag just to line the trash barrel. So, so don't, but anyhow, but yeah, so it's fine. It's good. It's interesting that the bag I use the most of is the one that's the least popular, but uh, I, I need to buy more of them, I guess. So. But thank you very much. I think it's a great system, and and we haven't we haven't heard any complaints from people who say they want to go back to uh, don't pay as you throw. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions or comments from the board? Joan. No, I look forward to the 33 gallon. <laughs> I've lost too many fingernails trying to <laughs> get it over. Okay. Questions or comments from the audience? Okay. Yep. I would just like to uh, put a shout out for composting by right because the apartment buildings, uh, like 3,000 people 
actually 2,000 housing units uh, can't uh, compost. Uh, the um, health department has called it a health risk and, and calling it garbage instead of compost. But um, I want to ask, because uh, I always tell people, how many tons do you think, just to estimate, I couldn't read the figures, how many tons have we diverted with the program? Looking at the sort of the pre years, which were 13 and 14, we were averaging a, a little over 3,400 tons a year. Um, Extra that we no. would no, that's total. Oh, that's total. Yeah, and then um, sort of the post the post pro of the program starting, it, I'm looking at between 2,200 to 2,500 tons. So we're in the neighborhood of a, a thousand tons per production. year. Per year. Diverted. Yes. yes. Thank you. And then the last comment was just that the price increase would be, the, the size of the, the bag would be increased by 10%, but the price would be 15%. So just putting a plug in for a lower price. Thank you. Great. Um, I think it's great. You know, I'm a huge fan of <laughs> I don't I live in an apartment, but I, uh, apart people who live in apartments can compost because you can compost at the transfer station. So I still do all of my recycling, the recycling sticker, and you're allowed to compost there as well, as well as use the swap shop. So we have a, I've not been home in four weekends, so I have a mountain of recycling and swap shop materials and compost in my freezer, but uh, people can do that. And I encourage folks, uh, even if you live in an apartment or even if you have uh, a trash and you don't want to compost on your own, you can get a pretty cheap recycling only sticker and still be allowed to do all of the other many great things that you can do at the transfer station. Um, okay, so otherwise do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, Janet moves and Jan uh, Joan seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. All right. Thank you, Corey. I think that's finally it for you. <laughs> okay. And up next is the appraisal discussion for 252, 252R, and 256 uh, Main Street. So, Selby and, and or Steve, I don't know if you're tag teaming that. So in your packet is a quote from John Avery for an appraisal of the Kmart Plaza owned by a stop and shop. Um, if you read through it, he says it's not taking into, into consideration the lease. Uh, there's about a little under three years left on the lease um, to Kmart by stop and shop. So he's not going to take that into consideration in the valuation of this under this proposal. That's pretty much, this is a product of a Citizens petition at town meeting, and in a discussion with um, John Benson and Peter Berry, they both said it was a good idea. So I went ahead and got a quote, and it, the price is just under seven thousand dollars. Great, great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Peter. Uh, I know we knew. I, I know the town uses uh, John Avery a lot to do appraisals. Um, I, I assume the price is reasonable, but did you solicit any other quotes, or, and is it okay to go with one quote? Yeah, I understand that, but does it make good fiscal sense to ask for three quotes? Steve, can you use, sorry. <laughs> you got one more meeting to do. <laughs> I'm old, I don't remember. Um, when we've had a conflict, when, when, when Mr. Avery has represented some other owners and we've gone out, they're, they're all priced about the same, really. Okay, any other questions? John? Yeah, I think um, this is information we, we really need. Um, and John Avery can do an excellent job. Um, I've never met him. I've used mm -hmm. him, and other lawyers have used him in my old practice area of family law. And, and his work was excellent. And, and more to the point, um, lawyers would hire him as a third party neutral because his work was so balanced and fair. And um, I think we'll get a, a real good report from him. Great. Okay, Janet. 
I just, uh, I know we were emailing something else, but I, I just wanted to note that this doesn't mean, whatever the results are of this, it doesn't mean that we're committing to, to doing anything with the parcel. Um, we're just finding out what the appraised value is, so, for future. I mean, it could be useful in a number of ways. Um, Right, yeah, I'll agree. This is just a information gathering and a response to the town meeting non-binding resolution, but I do not think in any way it commits us to anything um, or to saying that we approve of or support buying this parcel. It's information gathering. Um, okay, questions or comments from the audience? Chair Frederick, West Acton, thank you for moving on this. Uh, it's a good mark to show that we respect town meeting's votes. Um, I couldn't hear what you were saying, Selby. You said somebody said that you talked to some people and thought it was a good idea. I didn't, I couldn't hear what you were saying when you were leading up to it. It was at a meeting with John Benson and Peter Berry. Okay. Sitting on the porch of the Colonial Inn after having lunch <laughs> with Chris Starr and Chris Bailey on May 11th, 2018 at approximately 2 o'clock p.m. <laughs> Great. And Too much information. They all thought it was a good idea. I, which I didn't understand. I didn't make it to that meeting. <laughs> didn't even know about it. It wasn't a public meeting, nor would it have okay, to have you, been, you, so. I think what you're saying is that you felt, you talked to a couple of people and you felt like, generally right. speaking, people thought it was a good idea. Okay. Um, so, of course, I'm going to put a pitch in for a public market. I don't know if anybody's looked at what that is. I forgot to send you the link. I'll send you the link for what public, these public markets are popping up everywhere and they're really, really popular. There's tons of vendors inside. It's like a big, huge flea market with food courts and performance spaces and all kinds of things going on. 80% um, of people in the survey I did wanted this and it kind of mirrored the vote that happened at town meeting. But the reason I stood up was really to um, ask, because of the town meeting vote, I had said it would probably cost like $20,000 to do this appraisal because John said very conservatively with, you know, like no notice, he said, you know, about 20,000 would be conservative. And that's what I told town meeting and we got the 82% voting for this. So I'm hoping that since it's only 7,000, that you can ask them to do a second uh, appraisal of what the parcels would cost after the proposed rezoning. Because that way we'll know if we've added, if we would add millions of dollars to the value of the property, that we then could perhaps make the zoning a little bit different so that we can actually get what we want and need as opposed to the developer dictating what they can do with the poor woes of economic viability. Um, I feel like we need to get a better handle on what we can actually get. And so I think that'll, if we got that information, we'd know what the vote would mean. Thank you. Okay. All right, do I have a motion to approve this request? So moved. Second. Okay, Peter moves and Janet seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, thank you very much, Selby. All right, up next is the RHSO amendment and FY19 budget. Yes. You can sit here or there, wherever is more comfortable for you. Um, I, I guess here, so I can okay. see you all. Yeah, great. Um, I think that um, there's a presentation in your packet, and I think it's coming up on the thank screen. You. Lisa's doing that. So it's very quick um, while she's getting that up. Um, I'm Liz Rust, and I'm the director of the uh, Regional Housing <coughs> Services Office, and we're here for the annual uh, update for the intermunicipal agreement, and this is a presentation that was done for the uh, town managers at their annual meeting. So I just wanted to start, uh, there's, there's eight communities in the Regional Housing Services Office, of which seven town managers are retiring in the next year <laughs> of the eight communities, <laughs> leading off with Acton, always the trendsetter. Um, so uh, it was real. Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be a, um, a time of change for all the communities in many ways, and, um, and, and I don't really know for the, for the RHSO as well. So we've offered to, as new town managers come on board, to uh, facilitate and help them understand this arrangement and what it is the RHSO does, because it's a little bit different. Um, the service model here in the package, I think that this is a review really for, 
for you. I think I've presented to some number of this uh, board before, but some of you are new, and that's it with the boards are always turning over. Uh, this is the service model where all the communities join through the intermunicipal agreement. It's a three-year term that is amended annually just so that you have the opportunity to ask questions and hear from the, the members of the staff. And uh, Concord is the lead community. That means that they do all the procurement. We are all, there are four people in the office and we contract through Concord. And you're, that's seamless to you. So it's really in some ways a procurement model to, to procure affordable housing services. And we do any number of services that are listed there on the left, some monitoring, inventory management. And uh, as I said, Concord really manages all of the uh, logistics with that and our computers and phones. and and rent and facilities. Um, so we, um, in terms of, a, we have some member support, so th support that we would provide to Acton specifically, and then things that are general for, for all the communities. We have a website that many people use, and that's www.rhsohousing.org, and so that there's information about the Acton uh, affordable housing and inventory as well as general resident assistance. We do trainings and we do the um, monitoring work. So um, across the, the towns, almost $3 million was appropriated towards housing at recent town meetings and this is a very high level um, of all the towns, the support that was given in Acton. We spend a lot of time with the planning department looking at the various housing proposals. I'm going to skip through all these other towns. Whoops. Uh, I, I skipped way ahead somehow. Here we go. Um, so this is what I call the RHSO work plan, and this has all the different pies of our activities. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but as I say, that we spend a lot of time in, with Acton on the... Um, the 40B developments this year in particular, we've spent a lot of time on Martin Street. Uh, the town is the monitoring agent for there, so we're helping the planning board with some of those activities. Um, and then for FY19, you know, again, we'll continue to support the member communities and um, maintain our office. So we are now actually in Acton. Our office is in Acton on Knox Trail. We have a very complicated address that if you send us something by UPS, you use the Acton address. If you send something by USPS, you use the Concord address. So it's very confusing for us, right? Um, but anyway, so we're, we're gonna stay there. Um, there was a model where every three years it was thought that we would move different offices and that's no longer the case. Concords agree that uh, it makes sense for us just to stay in the same office. Um, so this is um, information about the hours. It's really a model, even though you know, you're paying the dollars for, for membership, uh, it really translates into billable hours for us. That's how we work and how we're contracted. Um, so this is just a lot, of, a lot of detail on how we arrive at the numbers for the different communities. And uh, this is how that looks in terms of dollars. I think Acton is very close to the same as last year, as I recall, right? Um, yes, almost exactly. No, looks like $900 difference. Um, so it's, it's relatively uh, the same in terms of level of support. Uh, and this was particular to the um, town manager meeting. We're gonna... Um, do some a reserve in our budget, and then talking about Knox Trail as a permanent location. And then um, we've been in operation for seven years, and so this was just a sort of a summary of thanking the member towns uh, for that continued support. We feel that it's a sustainable model. We've added communities. I think Acton has now been a member for four years, maybe five tops, I think probably four. Communities have left, we've added staff, we've changed staff, so uh, it seems to continue to provide service to the communities, and that's our greatest interest to, of course, to provide value to all the member communities. Wayland joined this year, so we're just starting that process with them.
I think that's it. And then the rest of the material is uh, the actual agreement. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Okay. Any questions or comments from members of the board? Janet. Well, I just, I want to thank you, Liz. Uh, I think that it's a great, it was a great improvement when we agreed to participate in this and we've continued to finance our participation in it because, well, as, as the liaison to the Acting Community Housing Corporation, which really used to handle all this themselves, I, I can vouch for the fact that it's just you, you guys handle a lot of the tales that it would have been impossible for the ACHC to handle and you just, you've caught a lot of things and, you know, just sort of managed a lot of things that, yeah, it's just much more information. What I also like is that we, we get to see what other communities are doing. Like Sudbury was really busy, I guess, <laughs> in the past year. I probably have some big 40Bs or something. Um, I have a question, and then I, by the way, you added in this increased 2000 sort of uh, in the budget, you know, sort of increasing the hourly rate by whatever 63 cents to account for that, that's fine with me, it makes sense. Um, what is, what are these 13A preservation projects? Are they existing affordable complexes that are getting renovated? There's one in yeah. Bedford and one in Lexington or something. Exactly, so 13A was a um, mass housing, housing finance program hmm. um, that started really in the 70s and uh, it had a, what they call expiring use. So the projects that were funded through that, the, the affordable housing restrictions expired after 30 years. So that as the units um, are expiring, it was a very popular program. Many, many units were subsidized with that program. Um, the owner of the property able to sell the property at market value, uh, thus losing a lot of the affordability and affordable housing units. And I think in the hundreds of thousands of units across the state under that program. So both Lexington and Bedford had projects or units restricted under that program and were able to preserve those. So the owner is selling the property, the new owner buying and buying with um, preserving the affordable housing restriction or increasing it even in some cases. And my only comment is that uh, the RHSO office has the same situation that I do. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a Concord mailing address and, and, you know, I have to tell the delivery people that I'm in Acton. I've given up. I think they know. At FedEx just knows. I, I've Concord Mass just, you know, and they know there's that funny street that's actually in Acton where you have to deliver stuff. Um, and it, because it was just, it was getting too complicated. But yeah, my, my legal address is Acton, but my mailing address is Concord. Believe you me, it created con it, complications when I was campaigning, you know, and I thought, what's my return address on my campaign literature? Sure. Oh, I better put act in, and then that means it adds two days to the, to the transit time, so. But thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Great, any other questions or comments, Peter? Um, just in terms of the actual services you provide, the Acton Housing Authority is responsible for certifying their residents' income and the rent they pay. Yes. So what services do you provide to the Housing Authority itself? The Housing Authority has a number of units that are regulated under the, LIP, the DHCD Local Initiative Program, and the town is obligated to certify those units to the state. So we work with the Housing Authority and provide that certification for the town. Okay, and, and for 40Bs, ownership programs, do you actually monitor the registry of deeds if somebody sells that, or are they supposed to come to you first and say, we want to sell this property, and, and you calculate what the new sale price is supposed to be, or how, how do you deal with that? Um, so I think there's a number of parts of 40B ownership units that have already been sold and are the owners are living in them. Um, every year we look through the registry of deeds. Acton has 63 of those units. Yeah. And we go through the registry of deeds and we send out self-certifications to every owner, um, making sure that they say that they're still in compliance with their, with their unit. Acton is also the uh, designated monitoring agent for uh, a number, of, a small number of units. And so we report to Mass Housing for the town on those behalf. And when people want to sell, we facilitate the conversation between the owner and the monitoring agent. Sometimes that's the town, sometimes that's DHCD, yeah. and help them and then help the town 
uh, provide consents for refinancing or compliance certificates or whatever. We are often working with Steve's office to complete that paperwork. Okay, and, and there is no income restriction on a 40B home ownership, right? If somebody gets a great job after living there for a few years and doubles their income or something, they're still eligible to continue to live there as long as they... they right, those are deed it. properties. Right. So, so, you know, you own the deed, and once you own the deed, it's a legal deed, yeah. and yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I just had some questions about the charts here. Um, I mean, you got the budget that you showed us, I think. Mm -hmm. But there's another chart here called the budget after, and unfortunately there are no page, oh, I guess it's on page, no, like there's no page numbers. It's after the act and contract. Uh, doesn't seem to be consistent it, with this, the budget you is had, this huh? Is right here? No. No? That's not it. <laughs> I think it's after that. It's a, after all the signatures for all the towns, I guess. This one right here? Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. So you don't Does have the... I, I looked at that first, and I saw the $1,720 increase. That was like a 10% increase. But you don't have the adjustment that's in the first chart. Oh, uh, so the FY18 comparison does not have the adjustment hours. That's correct. So um, the, um, the adjustment, this is a 1300 and 1320. Which is in the first chart. Right. Okay. So that just happened in May. And you can see this oh, one okay. was done in oh, April. That was early. So okay. Acton okay. purchased additional that was an hours attachment in May. To the con contract? Is that what that was? Or something? Yeah, and this was so relative. Was. Really, the, the focus of the presentation is about FY19. Right. So FY18, you know, is changing on a okay. daily basis, you know. So, so it's so actually only a $400 increase for Acton. Uh, 900 I believe, right? Uh, 24093 to 24, Oh, four. Yes, thank you. Yes. Sorry. Right. That's it's what the chart small. says. The yes, chart no, says it looks like the type okay. is small. I didn't see that. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And you got 20,000. It goes from 8,000 to 20,000 administrative. Did you move there already? Are you in that space? So um, the, the administrative fee goes to the town of Concord, and it's traditionally $15,000 or has been in the past. And um, last year there was a year-end kind of mix-up where some of the FY18 monies were actually spent in FY17. So it wasn't, it looks like it was only, you know, 8,000. Oh. It was really allocated as 15, so it was over the year before. So it represents a $5,000 increase uh, to the town of Concord for additional uh, overhead. For moving expenses. No, just so additional overhead in terms oh. of, uh, you know, maybe some, some rent and IT expense and um, okay, so go. where's the moving expense? You say moving is expensive and disruptive. So we moved in this year, FY18. That was in the admin. Was that yes. taken out of the admin money? Yes, it okay. was. Okay, thank you. Sure. Great. Thanks. Any other questions, John or Joan? No. Okay. Um, just thank you very much. The, the work that you do is really great, and um, as Jay mentioned, has been a really great program for us to be a part of um, doing this regionally. So um, I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Questions or comments from the audience? Uh, just before you, uh, just let me mention generally that the town pays for this out of the CPC, CPA yes. fund, so um, it comes out of the affordable housing uh, pot that the CPC uh, runs. Correct. Yep. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Yep. Chair Fredericks, West Ivan, and thank you very much. I love the fact that we're doing this regionally. Um, my issues I have are with the infographic. Um, and I can uh, talk to you privately offline if you'd like, but I do want to make people aware of my thoughts on this, um, and I've talked to several people in Green Acton who are also concerned. Uh, some of these things are very misleading. For example, the um, first thing, it talks about 24% of all households have low incomes, right? So um, that may be, but 80% of those are not satisfied by 40B, and the, um, this infographic appears to end with that's why we need more construction. It doesn't talk to converting units. Um, there's, uh, let's see, one of these things say, renter-occupied units are less likely to include children. Well, of course, rented units have fewer bedrooms. The sales price are rising faster than uh, income. So if you take out the mansions, 
then you, you see a different tracking. And so there's lots of distortions in here that I feel like need to get reworked before this is put on the town website. And yet it, there it is on the town website without any review or commenting uh, relative to accuracy and making sure it's not misleading. Um, there's a uh, senior median income, $60,000, great. But that's enough to afford any of the townhouses around here. So I feel like we need to really look at this if we're going, like what is the goal of it? You know, I understand that we hired the consultant to convince us to approve more high density zoning. Um, but again, here our taxes are then paying for something that I feel like is misleading and we need to decide what is the goal of it. You know, if you said that the goal was to you know, get money out of town meeting to buy up thousands of condos, you know, I would say that this would be right in line with that type of strategy. But whereas it ends in with not doing that, then, you know, and, and with all due respect, you guys are actually looking at the possibility of helping us or facilitating a condo buy down program. Um, because if, if like ACHG doesn't want to do it, there's lots of other housing trusts. So I, that's why I didn't, I didn't know you guys actually help facilitate cross town, like Sudbury Housing Trust um, does the lottery, is the lottery agent for the West Concord units. Okay, wait, right. Tara, so, you, you need anyways. to address the board. This is not the time Sorry. to do that. Uh, or to so talk the, regional, the regional, the regionality or the regional solution is good. Um, I think that we have to um, also be converting units in large scale um, instead of just sort of making up things that lead people to believe that they need to build more. Thank you. Um, George, yeah, quickly. Tara, I really don't appreciate your sort of uh, condescending comments to um, the RHSO representative. I really don't like the way that you're saying that this, this material she's presented is misleading and that her role is to uh, force force people to authorize more more development of housing. I, I think that's very disrespectful and, and Inappropriate. Well, the, Tara, no, wait. You really do. Tara, that's not how I'm this is going to work. I, I will let okay. you know when Thank you can you. respond. Okay. I, you know, I'm just really, um, you know, if you have a grievance, you address it to us, okay? Um, and But, you you know, you're, you're just really um, condescending toward somebody who's working for the town and, and our, at least in my view, is doing a very good job. And, and it is all for the benefit of the town. There's not some sort of conspiracy. Um, behind the scenes with all these consultants uh, trying to just line their pockets. Um, this is all in the interest of the town. I know you don't believe that, um, but that's your belief and you're entitled to it. So, And I, I will note this, that Acton comes up with our policy related to how we want to address housing. The RHSO is here to help us with monitoring and implementing that policy. They do not develop, develop that policy for us, so it's not correct to direct that kind of accusations towards the RHSO. So I will let you briefly respond, and that's that. Okay, um, I am addressing my comments to the Board of Selectmen, and I apologize if you guys did the infographic, but it, the information came from Acton, the town, maybe that's the case. But either way, I feel like we as a town have to uh, decide what type of solutions we want to engage in when, when you do the surveys, and. 90% of the people say they want to convert existing units, but then, you know, the solutions that come out are almost 90% in the complete opposite way to build. And so I would like very much a process by which we can address these issues about this infographic because it seems inappropriate to, you know, whoever created it. Um, I, I thought you did because you put it on the in the report it said to create infographics, um, but uh, I feel like it's they're inaccurate and misleading. So I hope that, that in the spirit of good governance that we sit down somehow and go over why these things seem so misleading. And uh, you know, maybe Green Acton Land Use Committee can be a leader in that, or maybe one of you guys would like to sit down and understand. But we've got a, I've got, I've got an alternative survey. I've got an alternative infographic that shows in red why each item is. is I'm going to put it out. If you guys don't want to address this stuff, we have to get the information to people about what is going on behind the, you know, the scenes, and how this stuff is coming out. Because that, well, just 10 seconds more, that consulting consultant gig actually said in it. You can read the RFP. Um, 
if it is on the DocuShare, it says that they're being hired to go and find more votes for the town meeting. That's not the direct quote, so don't okay, say that. Sorry. Sorry. Right, so don't Sorry. say that. So I'm going to ask you to end here. Okay. And Tara, Thank you. you can, it's fine if you, as Judith said, you can disagree, but it doesn't mean that other people are wrong. And so it's saying to us that we have to sit down and you know, hear the facts because we somehow don't have them is frankly insulting. And I'm not letting you respond to this. So don't, so I, it's not appropriate to say that to the board and it's not true. It's insulting to the board, to town staff and to others that we work with and hire. So while you might disagree, it doesn't mean that we're wrong. Okay, so with that, we uh, need a motion to approve the um, intermunicipal agreement for the RHSO for FY19. So moved. Okay, Jan is moved, Joan is second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Okay, thank you very much for coming in tonight. Okay, so uh, the last uh, item on our agenda is committee reappointments. I will read this list. If you have any concerns um, about anyone, please say hold and I will hold that. Uh, Karen Myers for the Acton Boxborough Cultural Council, Jennifer I did not read these names beforehand, so I apologize to everybody whose name I'm about to say incorrectly. Jennifer Patinoad of the Acton Community Housing Corporation. Uh, it says Charles, but Charlie Cadillac for the Acton Nursing Services Advisory. <laughs> we have a little uh, upset there. Um, Ellen Feinsand of the Acton Nursing Services Advisory Committee. Adrian Hancock, Acton Nursing Service Advisory Committee. Florence Ross, Acton Nursing Service Advisory. Jean Lane, Acton Nursing, Nursing Service Advisory. Howard Sussman, Acton Nursing, Nursing Service Advisory. Adam Hoffman, Board of Appeals. Susan C. Miller, Board of Assessors. Michael Cruz, Board of Health. William R. Taylor, Board of Health. John Covert, Cable Advisory Committee. Elizabeth Franklin, Commission on Disability. Ann Corcoran, Commission on Disability. Francis Osmond, Commission on Disability. Walter Foster, Community Preservation Committee. Dean Charter, Community Preservation Committee. Terry Maitland, Conservation Commission. Paula Goodwin, Conservation Commission. Marion Maxwell, Council on Aging. Bonnie Lobel, Council on Aging. Jacqueline Friedman, Council on Aging. Ellen Feinsand, Council on Aging. Peter Darlow, Design Review Board. Tom Gillespie, Dog Park Committee. Betsy Crystal, Dog Park Committee. Okay. Mike Perry, Dog Park Committee. Claire Siska, Dog, Dog Park Committee. Karen Martin, Dog Park Committee. Josh Fischel, Economic Development Committee. Shirley Ming, Economic Development Committee. Cameron Cousins, Green Advisory Board. Mona Chandra, Green Advisory Board. Fran Arsenal, Historic District Commission. Victoria Beyer, Historical Commission. Jim Snyder Grant, Land Stewardship Committee, Lawrence Ullman, Land Stewardship Committee, Robert Guba, Land Stewardship Committee, Gary Kilpatrick, Land Stewardship Committee, Nan Millette, Land Stewardship Committee. I'm just gonna read all of these that are the Land Stewardship Committee. Philip Keyes, Andy Gatesman, Joshua Haynes, Sherman Smith, Todd Sakiris, James Salem, Jason Temple, and Jazana Gruber, all Land Stewardship Committee. Um, Bill Mullen, Ann Chang, and David Brown for the Main Street Master Plan Committee. Joe Will for the Recreation Committee. Steve Barrett, Nancy Gerhardt, Carol Mahoney for the Senior Disabled, Tax, Senior Disabled Taxation Aid Committee. James Yaron and James Citro for the Transportation Advisory Committee. And Ron Beck for the Water Resources Advisory Committee. Um, okay, Joan, you held Betsy Crystal. Before we get yes. to Jones, uh, Tammy Govea was left off. The Tammy list. chose not to re up, so okay. she should not be. So then I should take yeah. her. Um, okay, Joan, do you want to just briefly say why you held that? Yeah, we're trying to meet. With Can you just put it? Sorry. We're trying to meet with Betsy. Okay, yep, there's just some. Uh, you just want to talk to her before reappointing her to the committee is a concern. Okay. So does anybody have any questions or concerns with that? And otherwise, can I have a motion to approve all of the reappointments um, as presented outside of uh, Betsy Crystal? So moved. Seconded. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Great. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. So moved.
Oh, we had two motions. I'm going to count Jones as a second. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Just Any abstentions? And congratulations, Mr. Manager. Um, oh, well, we just adjourned, Franny, so oh, you can talk to us privately, but uh, yeah. I was. Yep, sorry, Franny.